Layer 1, the flip side of crypto. Today, joining me, Colin Platt. Colin, nice to have you. Thank you very much for having me here today. So, first of all, the question on everyone's mind is, what do you do? <laughs> I do. Great question. Um, so I am the, the CEO uh, of a platform called Unifty, U-N-I-F-T-Y. I can't even spell today. I'm sorry. I, I had my COVID shot last night, so it still kept me catching <laughs> up with me. Um, so I'm a bit slow today, but um, never mind. We'll press on. Um, so Unifty, in short, is a platform dealing with infrastructure for NFTs principally. Um, we, we don't make NFTs. Uh, we make uh, NFTs easier to use. Uh, the project was born um, by, by uh, a German gentleman named Marcus Bopp, uh, based in, in the Cologne area. Uh, he started the project uh, a year ago. Uh, he was working for a German software company, and this was a, a spin-out project uh, that he launched. Um, and I came aboard in January time and took over gradually as uh, COO mm -hmm. and then CEO of the project. Um, where the, the pain point essentially that we're trying to address is uh, NFTs show a lot of promise. Uh, and what Marcus saw last year and what I saw was something that uh, was very similar to what we saw in 2017 and before uh, with the ICO space. Uh, there were a lot of... Uh, ideas put out uh, and very little ability to execute on them. We saw a similar trend uh, in NFTs late last year where a lot of people got excited about NFTs. That really took off in, in Q1 of this year as, as most people probably remember. Everyone talked about NFTs, uh, NFT, NFT. A lot of people didn't even really know what that meant, uh, but they wanted to get in on that. Um, the problem with NFTs uh, and, and the reason I actually met Marcus was uh, I'm, I'm a bit of an amateur coder. Marcus is, is the tech guy, uh, fortunately not me. Um, and uh, they were very difficult to program. I have notions about solidity. I can work with regular tokens, um, but NFTs were very different and very hard and the tools were very, very poor. Um, so what Marcus set out to do was build a, a suite of tools that people could rely on that were decentralized, that were um, usable, uh, that could be accessed without needing to code. Um, and you could just put these in on the front end. The, the first project uh, he really put out there was an NFT farm. So this kind of combines the, the notions of DeFi, obviously a very mm. big topic, uh, specifically around last year with about a year ago with DeFi summer, people wanted to stake tokens and get more tokens out. Um, uh, later on, people got interested in NFTs. You combine these two options, you stake um, an ERC20 token uh, and you get an NFT out. Uh, so it's, it's quite a unique um, process. Uh, we set up a customized way that people could do this. Some others have set up more proprietary things. Um, we've also launched another uh, suite of projects, uh, products and services that allow people to swap NFTs um, to create their own marketplaces uh, that are decentralized and can be white, uh, white labeled. Yeah, so let's dissect all of that, shall we? <laughs> so that was a mouthful. Was. Great job. It was quite concise, actually. So just from the Daily Coin reader's perspective, so Unifty is as if a WordPress, in essence, for an NFT creator, right? So if I understood you correctly, using your platform, I can more easily create my own, let's just say, NFT, and then also sell it and or trade it, correct? As well as adding other utilities to it, yes. Awesome. So let's get the brass tags, shall we? The problem with NFTs currently is they're bloody expensive to make, one. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's I have very creative people all around me, designers, artists, etc. The moment I begin explaining how to make an NFT, they go, this sounds too complicated. I need a computer science degree. What do you want me to do? <laughs> I, can I can barely work an Excel sheet, yeah. right? So how, do you, how did you bridge that gap, actually? How did you go about creating the WordPress for, yep. for NFTs? Very good question. And, and kind of the first thing, let me tackle on the cost. Um, oh. uh, it, it's multifaceted. Um, first, obviously, the Ethereum gas, most, most NFTs are launched on Ethereum. Um, Ethereum gas is a big consideration. Right now, as we speak here in, in July 2021, early July 2021, I should precise because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, gas is, is relatively cheap. Right? And looking at gas prices, they're about 
uh, high single digits, low double digits, which is quite reasonable um, yeah. compared. But um, a few months ago, they were uh, regularly above 100 guay, which was yeah. very expensive. So minting an NFT would cost you minimum a couple of hundred dollars. Um, so the first thing that you, you Nifty has done is we're actually live and deployed in production on eight different blockchains. Um, mm -hmm. so from Ethereum, uh, which obviously a lot of people use and is still the most popular. Um, for us, we've actually seen something different. We're deployed on Matic, uh, BSC, uh, are our two most active platforms right now. BSC for a long time was by far the most. Uh, that's kind of come off. Uh, Polygon, Matic has picked up a lot of that. We're also deployed into another number of other blockchains, in, including Avalanche, XDAI. Uh, we're deployed now into Moonbeam. Uh, I always forget some in there, Celo. Uh, <laughs> I apologize to all of them. Um, we also have done some stuff with test nets uh, and we have bridges to actually move um, NFTs over. So NFTs can start in one network and move to another one, uh, which is quite a unique feature uh, specifically coming out of test nets uh, and specifically around NFTs. So by making this, this product available in blockchains that are cheaper, um, you make it more accessible. Now, yeah. a lot of people automatically ask, you know, is there the same buying pressure? It really depends. Um, we've seen a lot, particularly around certain times in BSC, Binance Smart Chain, as well as Polygon or Matic, uh, that there has been a lot of buying pressure and a lot of interest. Um, some of our artists are going in and selling out uh, their first NFTs, their first launches, making $20,000, $50,000 in a matter of minutes. Extremely good, especially for kind of a first time NFT sale. Um, yeah. We're not talking the $69 million sales. A lot of these artists are smaller upcoming artists. Uh, and we love to kind of see that stuff because it is, it's helping somebody actually sell their first pieces or at least as NFTs. Now, um, that brings me very succinctly into the second point you brought up, which is, I don't want to, I don't want to stereotype it, but if we have the creators, uh, people that are, you know, artistic or, or creating a lot of the things inside of NFTs, uh, and we have people that are technical and we kind of have a diagram. There are people that overlap, but a majority of people have a skill set that is either uh, the creative and they may know how to use functionally and very well things like Photoshop. I'll, I'll pull out Photoshop, mm -hmm. obviously much deeper, wider tools than just Photoshop, um, but they're, they're skilled in a certain number of things. But very few of them, <laughs> though not all of them, uh, happen to be very well versed in uh, using a blockchain, writing Solidity code in, in um, EVM blockchains, or doing a lot of these other things that you need to know how to do with NFTs. So kind of where we came from, either somebody had enough money, was creative, had enough money already where they could hire somebody uh, hmm. or a platform to do that, or they were willing to pay exorbitant fees uh, to these kind of centralized platforms. Uh, I won't you know, point out names, but a lot of the more centralized, more well-known platforms uh, mm -hmm. would take 15, 20 plus percent of whatever the artist uh, sold something Ooh. for. Um, and we said, well, there's a big opportunity. There are smaller artists that can't pay $100 uh, to create the NFT and aren't willing to give up 20 plus percent of, of what they earn um, because that would very likely leave them with nothing after. So we set out to build a platform that was very reasonably priced. Um, we, we give 100% of the control over to the person that creates it and they don't need to know how to code. It's, there's some forms, there's a little bit of technical stuff. We have tutorials, but it's, it's relatively easy to learn if you know how to use the basics of, of any kind of uh, D app. So in essence, you're creating a code, you're part of the codeless movement then. You can put it that way. Um, there, are, there are definitely areas where what we're building can be installed into things that involve code. Um, but given that Solidity and EVMs are very, very, uh, it's a specialized skill with very high risks. Um, what we're trying to do is, is help shift this so more traditional, let's say, web developers, hmm. um, people that know how to do HTML that are... Um, I guess easier to find and the stakes are slightly mm -hmm. lower um, can just build on top of what we've done. So it's, right. I hate the term building block or, or Lego, mm -hmm. which is what you hear in D5, but um, adding, adding that layer uh, in there so people can remove the complexity and don't have to deal with all of the, the very minute details of how Solidity works um, and can just go in and say, Hey, I can plug this into the back of my website. So in my mind, I kind of now understand what NFT does. I kind of have a, a business point understanding of why you began to do it. I kind of have a vision of how to do it, but you're coming into the market at a very interesting time um, where <laughs> NFTs kind of have a bad rap, let's be honest. And 
sometimes deservedly so. Um, could you give us a comparison? What do you think about public perception about crypto, NFTs in general? And are you still as excited as when you first started or less so? Great question. Great question. So let's let's start with kind of some of the, the headline things you hear a lot about. A lot of people obviously, um, let's say, let's take a step out of the kind of crypto circles that we run in um, and, you know, the quote unquote normies, <laughs> uh, the, the mainstream uh, that are hearing about NFTs, probably maybe their first access into crypto. Maybe you've heard of Bitcoin, maybe you've heard of Ether, um, but probably never used it other than maybe buying on Binance or Coinbase. Yeah. Um, when they hear about NFTs, the, a lot of people's first reaction was really about um, carbon emissions, carbon footprint uh, was the thing we heard a lot about, uh, especially in the beginning of this year of, you know, your NFTs, uh, artists are putting out NFTs and they're getting shamed by people saying you're, you're killing the Amazon and things like this. You know, I'm not going to get into to mining and proof of work and, and mm -hmm. defend it or throw it under the bus, um, but uh, there are, you know, this is one of the things that we looked at and we said, well, there are other options out there. There are other blockchains that don't have a proof of work. Um, and this does give people an option that they couldn't necessarily do. Given that Ethereum had most of the things happening on it, it was kind of the only option and you had to build your own. Um, by having a ready uh, ability to go out and do something someplace else, to an extent that addresses part of the problem, or at least that perception of a problem. Now, again, I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. I'd don't want to get into proof of work and, yeah. and that. Um, but for people that are concerned and would rather not work with a proof of work blockchain like Ethereum currently is, albeit it is moving to proof of stake or looking to move to proof of stake. Again, I won't get into that prickly patch. Um, there are other options like BSC or uh, Av Avalanche uh, or Celo that use proof of stake already uh, or Moonbeam, uh, which sits inside of the Polkadot ecosystem. These are good options for people that are concerned about that and would like to actively make the choice to do something else. That's the first point. Uh, the second thing that we heard a lot about is um, money grabs. Uh, there were a lot of NFTs that were put out, sold for a lot of money. There was no real obvious reason to the average person why these things were being sold for so much money, who they were being sold to, where the money was coming from, where it was going. Um, and inside of the crypto circles as well, there was a lot of confusion around, you know, am I being, is this a pump and dump? Like what is happening? Oh, yeah. And this kind of fit, very uh, nicely uh, into kind of our original thesis of, you know, NFTs need to be useful. They need to be valuable. They need to have a community. They need to be uh, something that people want and something people want to connect with. And our view um, is ultimately NFTs, we talk about artists a lot. Uh, NFTs are much wider than artists. We view them as a new kind of data structure that make it easier mm -hmm. for somebody that's creating whatever that is. That could be art, that could be games, that could be community and social tokens, that could be a huge range of things. It could be financial products um, with the people that are consuming these and making an easier two-way dialogue where you have that unique property that is associated with an NFT or semi-unique. Um, if you look at it that way, you can very easily uh, and quickly see, well, this, this spans across a number of things. There is value in you and I being able to connect and have some kind of ownership, whatever that is in between us, whether that is something concrete, tangible that's off chain or whether that's something that only exists inside of a blockchain network. Um, having that, that link between different parties of that is something that people would ascribe value to on an ongoing basis and very quickly moves away from, well, I just sold this art for some fantastic number. It mm -hmm. doesn't really matter what happens inside of it. It doesn't really matter that it actually, you don't own anything other yeah. than this token. Um, so I think moving away from that and giving people more education is a positive thing. Uh, and that fit quite nicely into it. Now, obviously, uh, this put us in the position where we are, where a lot of people kind of came in, maybe they got burnt, or maybe it didn't live up to mm -hmm. what they expected it to live up to. Uh, and now we're kind of being proven right at a time where it is harder to get interest in the market. It is harder to get eyeballs on our websites, in our groups, uh, to talk about this and talk about the thesis. Um, but uh, having been through a few cycles these, uh, as well, I, I've been in the crypto industry since 2013. Um, this is kind of the time, whether we're in a bear market or whether we're just temporarily depressed here, your guess, guess is as good as mine. Uh, this is kind of the, the time where uh, projects like We Hope To Be uh, can stand out for continuing to build and do mm. different things without needing to deal with 
the, the frenzy of people coming in and speculating on the product without really any intention of, of joining the community and, and developing yeah. and connect with people that are like-minded and want to build something that is sustainable into the future. Yeah, but uh, listening to you, I, I really appreciate what you guys do and basically that you're enabling creators, especially as, for example, as a non-coder myself, I can now think of, okay, maybe something I write one day, create one day, I can create an NFT, I can connect with others that way. This bridging, this bridge is very exciting. As it wasn't around, you know, 12 years ago, Bitcoin was just an idea. And it wasn't too long ago where crypto kitties was the only way to actually experience nfts mm -hmm. and look where we are now but i cannot shake this feeling colin i just cannot shake the feeling that this is still at its infancy it's still a bit weird if you if i'm not too uh, Oh, it's absolutely weird. And I think that's uh, that's one of the things that, that attracted me to crypto. Uh, I used to be an investment banker. Uh, I worked in the city of London. Um, I It was fun. Um, I was involved with the early Ethereum space in, in London in particular, but around Europe. Um, and I remember bringing uh, the Ethereum Foundation team from London in to meet uh, senior investment bankers in 2015. And it was... I want to say, you know, May, June time, the weather was starting to get nice. Uh, and these guys showed up in shorts and everybody was wearing, uh, everybody was wearing jackets and ties and uh, the kind of contrast in that. And when they walked out, most of the bankers kind of said, you know, what the hell just happened? Um, but the one guy, the, the COO of where the division I was working in kind of said, you know, the fact that they can walk in like this when nobody had heard of Ethereum in 2015, early 2015, this was before yeah. mainnet launch. Yeah. And they said, the fact that these guys can walk in and talk about these things competently should make these guys take pause um, and think about what is happening and how that may impact our industry um, in positive mm -hmm. and negative ways. Um, and kind of fast forward now, uh, six years down the line where we have things like DeFi happening. Now they've not taken over Wall Street. Um, they've not shut down the city of London. Um, but people are starting to take notice. Um, I think is is a really interesting analogy to what we're seeing with NFTs. And if you, the conversations and the quality of conversations that we're having already means that the mindset shift uh, between what I saw with bankers in 2015 yeah. to 2020, when DeFi summer really kicked off, and the conversations that bankers are having now, and I, I still speak, I spent a lot of time in DeFi as well. Mm -hmm. um, I still speak with a lot of bankers uh, that are starting to look into DeFi. To see already the access that we're getting with NFTs, they sh really showed up in public consciousness, as you pointed out, um, with CryptoKitties, even if they existed in things like Rare Pepe's, even before <laughs> Ethereum, um, yeah. they really didn't take off into the, the public uh, limelight until CryptoKitties and really more accurately until 2020, I'd say. Um, the fact that we're able to get into very large companies and have very high quality discussions at very high levels about you know, mm. what will this mean in different aspects of the industry that you've never even heard of. Um, and it's not always about art and it's not always about, you know, crazy disruptive, but the fact that they're willing to entertain weird people like us, <laughs> people that are even more out there and they say, I made, I've seen my colleagues, I've seen my friends make this mistake, and maybe I've made this mistake in the recent past. I'm not going to make it again. Uh, I think is a very positive bullish sign uh, over the next couple of years of where NFTs and you know crypto more generally can take can take us. So I'm I'm super excited of what's going to happen in the next five years or so. Um, I'd love to see that happen in the next twelve months, but you know I've learned time and time again yeah. never never make predictions on time or direction or height um, and things that go. But I think that the, yeah. the trend is very clear to me. Yeah. Wise man, wise words. And here's where we come to our show's staple, the flip side. Yeah. So, the flip side is, well, what do you think is your biggest challenge at the moment that you face daily? I'd say daily is, um, you know, uh, throwing it all out there. Uh, we are a project that has our own token. Um, now, having your own token is fantastic for a lot of reasons. Uh, it is a good kind of lightning rod for people to come in, see the project, go, I can, I can be involved with this project. I can, I can make a difference. Um, I, can, I can feel part of something the same way an NFT does. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, on the flip side, that also brings in um, a lot of our emotions about money, especially when um, 
price isn't going up as fast as they want it to go up or it's going down. That's always bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think that that kind of puts sometimes the, the project team um, at odds to an extent uh, with uh, with the people who want you know, short term things. People are always saying, you know, what's next? What's the announcement? What's next? Make something happen. And you kind of go, well, you know, we can either be reactive in short termists or we can kind of build something that we believe is in the best interest, which is the way I learned uh, to build mm-hmm. businesses is, you know, focus on the long term, try to build what you can uh, adapt, move to what the market's going to do. But if you're always focusing on, you know, let me go out and, and sign another partnership just to say I have a partnership with somebody. Yeah, maybe that brings in more people. Maybe they get interested. Maybe that pumps the price, and maybe that makes some people happy. But uh, mm-hmm. it's it's really not um, it's not in the best interest of the project because you're left. I've seen so many of these projects. You know, you come in, you make big announcements, and there's nothing that ever happens out of it. Uh, and I'm not talking about it doesn't happen in the next six months. I'm talking mm-hmm. the project dies before anything can happen, or there was no intention. Okay. Um, and this is particularly the kind of market right now where you see a lot of projects wanting to make these announcements all the time without really any intention mm. to follow through. Um, and that's quite tough because you kind of feel like I need these people to be happy to kind of keep everybody motivated um, mm. and not completely abandon the project and, you know, go talk, talk bad about it to all their friends. Um, you need people that want to use the platform you're building. Uh, you need people to kind of reach out and be your evangelist, which is when things are going well, what token holders are very good at doing <laughs> getting on Twitter saying, Hey, you know, I like this artist, go try this platform. Uh, we love to see people talking about Unifty and using our product. Um, we're very fortunate that we've been earning revenues um, pretty much since day one, uh, mm-hmm. which is very rare in the space to earn revenues at all. Um, and we want to see that continue to grow because that's really a sign of success. Um, and we believe in time that will translate into people wanting to use the platform, wanting to join the community. I'm not going to say what that that could do with the price because, you know, we can mm. never talk about price of a token. Uh, that's that's okay. the golden rule. Um, but uh, obviously having a greater network, uh, a greater interest is always positive uh, for the project in the entire ecosystem. Yeah. But if I push a little bit more on that flip yes. side, Please. the whole industry seems a bit... <laughs> There are, you know, there's a saying, there are a few bad actors, right? That basically in almost in every industry, it seems like we have quite a few more bad actors than the other industries, or at least it seems that way. Whenever I try to explain the NFT market, the DeFi market, the crypto market, uh, it seems as if I have to defend it constantly. Like it's not just a nerdy obsession, yeah. This is really changing how we interact with each other, how we create art, not just art, but really how we share information. And don't you, do you have that feeling as well that all your good effort is sometimes uh, downplayed by all of these negative uh, occurrences in the market, not to name specific projects or names? Yeah, yeah. Um... No, it's a really good question. It's something that I've uh, I think about often um, because uh, if we t- take a step back and, and yeah. rather than talking about the NFT space specifically, yeah. but talk about crypto more widely, um, there tether is is another one that people love to talk about and love to say. You know, there's the irregularities um, uh, without making yeah. a statement on whether I think those have basis or not um there are a lot of people that uh ask a lot of questions about tether say tether is not being forthcoming as well as on the other side a lot of people that say you know uh, what is being asked of tether is unreasonable when you consider what is not being asked of things like usdc or whatever um but i think it comes down to really kind of its core function crypto is um I think at its core essence, um, kind of the the end game of, of financialization. Everything is turned into a number that can be traded and money can be made in most of it. Everything done in crypto is about money. Um, and I think when you look at other facets of life of places that are heavily financialized, you see a lot of things where, um, how to put this, uh, people look at actions after the fact and say, that may not have been how I would have interacted uh, Mm -hmm. had I been in that position Mm -hmm. or could I have done that again if money had not been part of that equation. Uh, Everybody likes to think um, that they're doing the right thing uh, and having incentives around money uh, sometimes can encourage behavior 
that uh, is not what people would have done uh, if it was based purely on their own gut feeling. Now, um, not to not to jump in and be you know greed is good guy, but uh, I think there are a lot of areas where, when designed right, um, financial incentives can be a positive thing, um, and they can drive desired behavior to a communal positive that uh, would be hard to achieve without that. If everybody just wanted to always do the right thing, mm. um, that's great. But unless there's kind of this, you know, uh, invisible hand, uh, to put it in the Adam Smith terms, that brings us to this optimal state, which nobody really individually knows, um, it's very difficult. Now, um, if we kind of zoom into NFTs, we see a lot of this thing that's happened because there was a lot of money pouring in the industry, the same way that ICOs brought a lot of money and a lot of focus into the industry in 2017. Um, And a lot of people took advantage of that. Um, Now, I don't know that I would go out on a limb to say uh, that there are more, uh, I hate the word scams, there's more kind of bad actors or uh, dishonest intentions now than there were then, or that then or now are worse than other industries, because you can definitely see a lot of industries um, where there are bad actors. Um, What has shocked me, I guess, time and time again is, I guess in crypto, when you've been around the space, you're kind of conditioned to expect everybody, you always have to watch your back and everybody's out to get you and take your money and do whatever. Um, And you know, you see it, Uh, you see people that you go, "Hmm, okay, Uh, somebody's coming into my telegram, making grand promises and then trying to scam you and, you know, making fake telegrams pretending to be you, Mm -hmm. scam your community and get them to sell coins and give away coins and whatever it is. Um, So that happens a lot and you need to watch out for those things. And I think because we're dealing with internet money and because people generally have pretty bad OPSEC, um, it's uh, it's easy for them to make money out of that. Now, that's unfortunate. Um, But what what shocks me, uh, I guess, is when you kind of zoom out of this and you see the people that are coming into crypto for the first time, in my experience, I've generally been the ones that I've been the sharkiest, <laughs> the, 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 the most prickly of, you know, the first time crypto person sees these big numbers happening and they go, I can come in, do no work and make $10 million, $20 million yeah. uh, with no, no work. And they are, they will fight for that. And they will throw their own mother under the bus for that. They will ruin friendships and co- like uh, collegiate relationships that they've had for years um, at this chance of making money. Whereas, you know, people that have been in crypto realize, all right, it's nice to see a big number on the screen, you know, in your wallet, but there's no liquidity behind this. So it's, it's not actually the money that I think it is. And I think that grounds people very quickly where you see, you know, I've got block folio or whatever, and I've got X millions of dollars in it. And you go, if I actually tried to sell that, I'd maybe make a hundred thousand dollars and having, you know, the incentive to get $20 million, if you think you can get it or a hundred thousand, you're less likely to compromise everything for a hundred thousand. Now, I've seen people definitely for that amount of money where that for them is life changing and they will do whatever they can to get any amount of money. Um, And that is inside of crypto, outside of crypto, wherever it is, uh, without putting kind of any value statement on that. But I think um, when you make everything so financialized and you boil everything down to that, you do need to be very, very careful about that. Uh, And I think it kind of comes back to my previous point of... um, Every, all of these incentives need to be well thought out. Mm-hmm. They need, you need to be working in the space, very understanding about, you know, you hear a lot of personal stories where people go, uh, you know, I screwed up and I sent this to the wrong wallet. I lost all my money. Um, mm-hmm. And for you, you might go, it's an insignificant amount of money. Uh, maybe it's a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, and for you, that might not be very much money. For some people, that's, that's all of their money. That's all of their life savings. Um, and they lost it because they lost the, the seed to their wallet, or maybe they, sent to the wrong address uh, or the wrong kind of wallets on the wrong blockchain. And you kind of go, well, I, I can't be the bleeding heart and just give away, you know, community tokens, more tokens. There's not really a lot you can do. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's a very difficult thing to try uh, and, and weave and do the right thing. But at the same time, you have to be kind of, uh, stoic about it when you're faced with yeah. stories that sound very, very difficult. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, not all of them, you know, you want to believe everybody, but not all of them are honest. Uh, <laughs> and you have to be very cynical about uh, how you deal with all this stuff, which is tough. Yeah, <laughs> I, I try is. not to, to be that person, but uh, you know, you need to keep a solid shield around you when you're working in crypto. Yeah, but that's exactly the kind of answer we definitely wanted and daily coin readers want is 
I wish every project and every founder was as open as you. And actually, it's more an empathetic view on the whole market. And now to shift gears a bit, excitement, right? So Unifty, what's next for Unifty? What are we looking forward to in the future? So we're very fortunate uh, to have Marcus. Um, Marcus loves to build things. Um, <laughs> and he's always got crazy ideas. Um, and he's got a lot of new products uh, that he's working on. Um, some things that we've announced about uh, how to do new auctions and new ways that uh, artists can introduce, uh, artists or creators, I guess more generally, can introduce NFTs to the market. Um, a lot of what people have seen is kind of you sell NFTs in two ways or you distribute them in three ways. Mm-hmm. First way is, you know, you put out a price, you say, this is a price I'm selling the NFT. You buy them on OpenSea, Rarible, whatever platform mm-hmm. on Unifty, hopefully. Um, <laughs> and it's just a price. It's like going to the store or anything else. You also see a number of auctions. Sotheby's, obviously the big auction house, uh, got very, a lot of press around some of these big high number ones where you know, the price goes up in an English style auction. You have some variations around this, but that's most of it. Um, I said, those are the two ways to sell it. There's three ways to distribute them. Um, You have a lot of people that give them away. Um, Mm -hmm. NFTs can be given away just like any other type of token. That happens a lot. And those those are a great way to do a number of things. Now, um, there's more. There's more different iterations, ways that you can do these. You can put them in a bonding curve, uh, which means very much like Uniswap or any of these AMMs. Uh, As more people start to buy them, now these be Mm. NFTs where there's multiples or multiple editions. The first ones are cheaper and then they kind of go up in price as people buy them off. Um, That's one one thing that we're looking at. We're also looking at um, other other ways that people can kind of put these out, find prices for NFTs, create um, kind of more reliable prices for NFT sets of NFTs related to different creators over time. Um, and we're also looking at kind of how we adapt our, our farms because we think that that's a really cool product that it is it's kind of a niche, but it does answer a lot of the problems that projects have, which is, you know, I have a community uh, that I want to follow me and I want them to do something. Um, I can't just keep giving them mining rewards and throwing more tokens out to the market for a lot of reasons. Some of them technical, some of them economic. Um, but uh, what else can I, I give? Well, you can go out, you can commission somebody to create NFT uh, artwork or creations for you or integrate NFTs into your project. You can have people stake your token and they get NFTs out, which is quite cool. Um, but we're looking at how we can kind of uh, open up our farms. Uh, right now, they're all independent. Each farm is kind of its own silo. We have a number of farms that we want to work together as a network. Um, so that's one of our next things that we hope to be announcing more on. Um, we also have a couple of ideas around how we can kind of enlarge our product offering at Unifty to cover things that are um, kind of generic smart contracts, let's put it that way, uh, that can span across many different industries. A lot of people are interested just how can I create my own token? Uh, maybe I want a social yeah. token or you know, I want a token for... Uh, a specific purpose. I, I've seen people put them up around events. Uh, we did something for uh, a large virtual event uh, in mm-hmm. late May. Um, people love to have these tokens, even if nobody has any value. It's just a good way to, to put them out like festivals yeah. have, you know, these, these points that don't really have a dollar value to them, mm-hmm. um, but they help bring people in for a week long event. Now that's quite cool. You can do it. There are tools to help you do it, but to have that integrated, to have that on other platforms other than Ethereum uh, readily available is something that is still a bit lacking. Um, right. And the other thing that we're kind of doing is extending our reach. Um, we want to hit more more networks. We want to make it more usable, plug into more wallets. Um, we want to offer white labeling solutions for our marketplaces so anybody can kind of come in, build right. a market that's only their NFTs, not you know OpenSea, which right. is you can kind of think of like Amazon. <laughs> think of something like Shopify and plug that into your own website. So imagine I'm an artist, I've got a bunch of NFTs, I've got my own website, I go plug that into my website and people can come there only buy my NFTs on my website. That's quite a cool thing. Uh, we think that that will attract a lot of people. That is probably our most demanded thing. Uh, and that, that should hopefully come out in the next couple of months. So I'm really excited about uh, ultimately where our project is going, which is to help people um, create that connection between creators and their communities which is ultimately helping to drive a more sustainable NFT and adjacent uh, economy. We think that uh, really our job is to help people build and create in a sustainable way the types of businesses they want to run. Amazing. So that's everything I could have asked for. So thank you everyone for watching. This was the flip side of crypto. 
together with Colin Platt. Thank you, Colin. Thank you.